Ismat, you know, I've much enjoyed what I've learned from you on all our trips. Yes. Polymathic is what I'd say. But can I start with just asking about your formal profession, that of an architect, and the fact that, you know, when you were young, you were working with Jeffrey Bawa in perhaps one of the most dynamic periods of Sri Lankan architecture. What was that experience like? Working with Jeffrey Bawa was quite an interesting episode in my life because I started quite early. As soon after he came back in 1959, back mm -hmm. from the AS school, and met both Jeffrey and his partner, Ulrich Plesner, who was here only up to 1967. But uh, I was, we had a much uh, greater freedom working with him because he accepted us, us as more than students, just, um, it is a sort of renaissance type education where you worked with him and you did the drawings as well as, not like now where you're doing computer work, but real drawings, measured drawings, and detailed drawings of trees, birds, animals, in, in the architectural drawing, and then more to the, you know, uh, the added responsibility was that he wanted us to work as artists, sculptors, or painters, so which we ended up by uh, doing the interiors, you know, supplying furniture, textiles, which immediately led me to working with Ina de Silva and Barbara Sanzoni. And um, so that was quite exciting because both Barbara and Ina were also recruited in a sense by Jeffrey because he, unlike most architects, and also because of the conditions in Sri Lanka, the there was no ready supply of furniture and furnishings. And Jeffrey felt a great need for this, and he set up, virtually, he set up Ina and Barbara, because he became sort of the main patron to do large-scale, you know, batiks and handlooms for hotels. Right. So they, they then, you know, prospered, and they also you know, expanded, and both expanded in, in the sort of commercial as well as the aesthetic sense, and they sort of diversified into various, uh, you know, aspects. Were you involved at all in the Ina house? Because one of the first houses Jeffrey did, or was that just before you joined No, no. Him? I was, but in a very marginal sense at that time, because it, Jeffrey had already, you know, perfected the 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 drawings and so on. Lucky Sen Naika, who I befriended, did quite amount of the work and the drafting for Jeffrey. Jeffrey couldn't draw at all, you know, he really? just was one of these architects, you know, very rare, because for that generation, he should have been able to have been, you know, at least hold a pencil and do very good sketches and mm. perspectives. But for some strange reason, all his work was translated by us uh, into, you know, drawings and... It's quite fantastic because he had an extraordinary imagination. Yeah. But he couldn't put it down on paper, so it had to be done by all of you. Yeah, he, he would draw it on a very tiny scale mm -hmm. and that would be used as a sort of, you know, the, the blueprint for us to develop it. But he would see, it, even when he did draw it, he would continue to review it and, you know, criticize it and review it again till it got perfected. But a lot of his work was actually seriously done at sight, at a great right. cost <laughs> to the client. Yes. Was, everything was moved around like a stage set. It was moved around at the site and... Of course, one thing I found about... I found him doing this once, quite late in his career, when he and Ina went on the site. Yeah. And of course, I got the impression Jeffrey didn't like color, and Ina adored color. And these two very different people sort of saying, you know, white, no, red and blue. Yeah. 
Um, how did they work together? Because they were, in a sense, very contrasting personalities, but they complemented each other fantastically, I felt. You, you know, what really happened was when we, when, uh, when uh, I and three others who were working at Edward Reed and Beck, uh, Firoz Choksi and Ratna Vibhushana and Vasan Satyana Ratna, when we came back from Denmark, we introduced a lot of color and we, we were, you know, we had visited Finland and Norway and Sweden and there was a lot of colorful textiles which were being produced by young designers mm. and, and in the furnishing and so on. So even, you know, introduction like Samara, you know, which is yes. the earth color, and robin blue, mm -hmm. you know, we used to, you know, use it for bordering the paintings, murals on the walls, and gold leaf, and so on. And uh, we, I remember designing uh, sarongs for Serendib, and uh, at that time, I think quite a number of the young wait, waiters didn't like the idea of wearing a sarong, which is for them socially going back, yeah. you know. But we designed the sarong so well, they were very colorful, and they had that sort of special type of belt, which, you know, which used to be in the 1920s with the purse. The hoodie, yes, yeah. of course. All yes. that was introduced. It looked so elegant, I mean, yeah. so much better than a mock, yeah. you mock, know, trousers. You know, yes, and white trousers and sort of yeah. Nehru shirt, you know. Yeah. So, then with Barbara Sanzoni and the introduction of uh, Ina's work, when I was away in, Copenhagen, I did a lot of engraving and uh, lithography. And then it struck me that both of them were struggling with foreign exchange at that time. And there was a system, I don't know whether you remember, there was a thing called FIX. Yes. Where if you were an exporter, if you did export to encourage you to export, it was converted into Convertible foreign currency, exchange. which wasn't convertible for yeah. the main part. Yeah. Yeah. And also, if you, if you did... Uh, satisfy the requirements of the import authority mm. that you were going to get dyes and material for your business, then you would have free of duty. So we had, uh, I organized two exhibitions at the tea center, right. one for Ina, and she made as much as 44,000 Danish kroner, and so did Barbara. Right, great. And uh, it was in the most, uh, fashionable part of the walking street in Copenhagen and which is the tea center which is a sort of this was in the mid 60s or yeah 67 68 right, right. You know? and before that I had already started working with Ulrich Plesner doing measured drawings with him as the head uh, you know organizer because as a young man he'd been doing a lot of work in uh, in Copenhagen for the Royal Danish Academy. That's where he organized the scholarship for us. And he had been doing uh, documentation of old castles of Denmark. Right. You know? So he knew the system, how these things should be done. And we did a quite amount of drawings of, uh, of uh, 17th to the 19th century buildings in rural Sri Lanka. I'm back in Gadladenia, uh, Lankatilaka, Kalpitiya Fort, and... I mean, those records are great, and perhaps that may have led to the fact that when archaeology took off in a public way in Sri Lanka, I'm talking of the last 30 years, yeah. as opposed to the British, who were really quite good at discovering yeah. the old things, uh, that Roland Silva, who I think was a rather important figure, yeah. used architects as partners with archaeologists. Were you involved in that process with Roland? Uh, I was only in a limited way. I, I, I was a bit suspicious that unless you really had a background to archaeology like Roland did, because Roland first became an archi architect and then did a degree in archaeology. So unless you had some sense of architectural, uh, archaeological discipline, I thought, you know, you might not be able to, with your enormous amount of work in Colombo, that you might not be able to interpret 
you know, archaeology had become a distinct science. It was, you know, it was not sort of uh, one of these things which you, you know, you romantically took for, you know, going to see Giria or Poranaru and just, you know, holding a celadon vase or <laughs> just right. a piece of treasure because it, it involved far more, you know, uh, discipline than that. So I, I, I was nervous myself to undertake it, but I was on the periphery doing work for uh, R.L. Brohier on the historical side of buildings right. and research. And uh, other than my, uh, during that time, we also had a whole host of artists coming to work for Jeffrey Bava and Ulrich Lesner. And one of the most fortunate thing was we had Donald Friend, who came and stayed with Bevis Bava. He was probably one of Australia's best draftsmen Absolutely, and probably yeah. amongst the five best uh, painters of his generation. And uh, he came and uh, Ulrich offered him three major, with Jeffrey's permission, because Jeffrey was the sort of big boss, and uh, the large murals mm -hmm. in gold leaf, and one in bars, and the other two in, in uh, McKinnon's, and another one, John Keel's, you know, large scale murals, which he did. And Lucky and I got influenced by his work, and he taught us uh, you know, the techniques of gold leafing. Right. So that this really panel behind me was roughly done about at the same time. It's 22 karat gold beaten to one two thousandth of an inch, you know, oh. and applied. And a packet of gold leaf in the gold leaf makers for a 200 year old firm is about 70, 80 pounds, you know, so you have to be really, really The careful. value of that today, yes, I don't think one would be On gold leaf alone right. is something, you know. And so gold leaf was nothing new because all the Greek icons, the Russian Orthodox churches, you know, you go to Thailand when you couldn't offer, you know, in Thailand and South Asia when you couldn't offer something to the temple which was really cast in gold. You could do it with a lesser metal and then, and then gold leaf the it and course. give it to the temple, you know. So there's a lot of gold leafing going around all over. And so, and also uh, Donald Friend did a lot of very beautiful, uh, slightly exaggerated versions of natural history drawings of trees, birds, animals, fauna and flora of Sri Lanka. So we introduced those elements into Jeffrey's drawings for the client's houses. So when we would do a section for Ina, hmm. we would actually draw the tamarind tree and the aralia right. trees that you could actually recognize In it instead of doing these rather figurative stylized trees which architects often did on their right. drawings. I, I was always interested in archaeology, I think because it has its links to architecture mm -hmm. and also that you were borrowing old you know, something intrinsically Sri Lankan. If you knew your archaeology, you could borrow it and adapt it to, you know, present day condition. Partly because when we started designing the lodge at Habarana, mm -hmm. we were determined to flood a good part of the, the, uh, the site. So we tapped a stream which used to go out and the, the irrigation department condemned it and we were very annoyed about it, but we, we drove it through the site, produced a fairly big mm. uh, body of water, and then let it into the tank again. So we were let off the hook, so right. to speak. But I think one of the three things that really define the, the landscape architecture, which one reflects in archaeology in Sri Lanka, is rice, water, and irrigation and the channels, you know. Right. Wherever you go in Sri Lanka, in the older part of Sri Lanka, in the dry areas, especially in Anuradhapura and Polonnaruwa, it's the most dominant factor. And it's sad that we don't have it used much more in all our hotels and larger schemes. 
Jeffrey has used it in a limited way in the parliament. But I think the thing was in at the Lodge Harbour, and uh, whichever window you look from, you see this huge expanse of water and a lot of trees. Unfortunately, we couldn't find the paddy, paddy part of it, right. but it would have been nice to have planted some acreage of paddy. You know, it's full of interest, you know. And it's then when I met Brohier, R.L. Brohier, and he has been working from the time as a young man in the 1920s when he was in the survey department, he used to take a special interest in irrigation, you know, drawing and irrigation schemes. And he published this book for DSN Naika in 1937, I think. And uh, I, those three volumes I used to carry with me in the car. And, you know, right. every tank had to be searched out and all the anecdotes looked at. And yeah, the problem was that, you know, archaeology got separated from irrigation and it went into the background when it should have been the primary thing because in the design of the old cities like Anuradhapura and Polonnaruwa, the first source that they would have tried to work out, where do we get the water from mm -hmm. to run this huge million people city, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you needed, and the use of water in ritual in Sri Lanka, water cutting, water this, your first time, you're, you know, you're anointed with water when you get married, water is poured on you. And it's, you know, all this ceremonial thing, water is used. So it's, it's, uh, they should have actually started with, you know, where did these irrigation schemes originate? Yeah. What was the, the, the force behind? Because even the Mahavamsa talks about, more about, okay, partly the Buddhist contribution by kings, but the other major thing was that they fed the people. Mm -hmm. And the enormously complex, it's not simply the water, it's, it is the fact that when you had a long channel which went on, say, if you look at the uh, riverine system in Sri Lanka, it's like spokes of a wheel, except for the Mahavedi, because due to some quirk in geology, it was going all the way to Minipe, then it swung around and then headed north to Trincomalee. Mm. But there must have been some point in the geology of Sri Lanka, two rivers got locked up, you know. Otherwise, yes. all the rivers are only 80 miles and 90 miles, mainly from the center of the, the, right. the island, right? And then they go out to sea. So, the, the, but if you look at the whole map of Sri Lanka, the amazing thing is there is no single body of uh, art, uh, uh, natural body of water in Sri Lanka. There is no lake at all. Nothing to speak of. Even the lakes that we are very familiar with, the Beira Lake, the Candy Lake, and the Noreli Lake were built in colonial times. And the other 20,000 reservoirs were built by the ancient kings. So you really, except for the lagoons, which are just an artificial part of the sea, there is no real body of water. So it was all created by man. And also the amazing thing is between in the dry zone, the between the highest point of uh, the Mahaveli, you know, by the time it gets down to the lowlands, and to the degree it's been taken out, it's a very small difference in height. So you had this incredibly engineering skill where the water was taken over huge distances where the drop was so little. But I think one of the most important things which has been forgotten about this whole technology is that more than the technological part of it, there was always a control of water. So when, when you went into a terrific dry period, there would have been all sorts of rules, land tenure laws, where the amount of water you could get from the headwater system of the canal, it would have limited you and you would have to go through a whole series of you know, watering your lands in relationship to the guys who are at the bottom of the, you know, the channel and how much of water you can tap, how much of water you can use, the amount of angling and fishing and the resources from the water, all of that has been listed. And the Portuguese, when they came, 
they had a doomsday book, mm -hmm. right? And that was based on these land tenure laws, and that was followed by the Dutch. And these are based on, you know, 7th, 8th century, 9th century, sophisticated laws relating to land. And all of that, I don't know, there must be somewhere somebody had published a small, tiny amount, but this whole system of how these channels were controlled and tapped and whether you could divert a little into your own, you know, you can see even now the big problem in Israel and Palestine and India between Karnataka and, you know, Tamil Nadu is all these small diversions that are taking place and, you know, upstream between Nepal and yes. India. Yes, I must say one thing that struck me, and you know, I do all this work in the East and the North, and the absence of a water policy is, I think, one of going to be the big problems because, as you said, people are quarrelling, and if you have very clear rules and guidelines based on study, it is what we need, and what you say that we had this all these centuries ago. But let me come back to something that has always struck me. You mentioned the Maha Valley. In a different context, it's, but I think one of the most fantastic stories you've told me is how, as a young man, you went on a raft down the Maha Valley. Must have been, what, 40 years ago? Yeah, 1964. Gosh, yeah, yeah. Yes. What was it like? It must have been an extraordinary experience. Uh, the reason was this, in, this interest in the irrigation scheme. Yeah. And I was always interested in trying to find out you know, the the Mahaveli, the the scenic part of it and the wildlife part of it. And that's also a challenge because it had been done several times before by people like, you know, in the 30s by R.L. Spittle, I think. And then uh, uh, I think uh, Crow, you know, who was the uh, U.S. ambassador, right. Philip, Philip Crow. Crow. Philip Philip Crow. Crow. And in between by Maura Stevens, quite, you know, every 10 years or so somebody's done this. But those trips were heavily organized with 300 coolies, people mm -hmm. walking along the banks, every GA being told to check whether these people have been safe. Right. Uh, you know, so it was a, an organized, you know, palanquin trip. Mm. But ours was simply a case of going to a site persuading the site people to give the bamboo and the banana, you know, the, uh, things as a float, the trunks. And it was lashed out and prepared there, lowered onto the, onto these fast rushing waters of the Manampitiya Bridge and let loose so that you drifted with the speed of the, the river. And for one thing, you had always had the, insurance that you are not going to lose anything because when the raft comes apart, you just get up and walk across a wheel loo and get back home. So you don't really lose any money, except the speed at which you are moving is obviously limited by the flow of water. Mm. And the easier thing as well is that if you had a fiberglass boat or a wooden boat, you can't abandon it. You have to get somebody to carry it. It's too heavy, the oars and so on. The raft is pretty light. You just drag it along the river and you drift along. How long did it take you from Manampitya to the mouth? No, we really didn't, couldn't make it to the mouth of the river because, the, because there are a few rapids along the river right. and huge kumbuk trees have fallen across it. So the raft used to run into this, you know, quite seriously. And it would be quite tricky because, you know, we had to lift our feet up right. because you know, the raft is to smash into huge, yeah. sharp, you know, uh, branches and so on. But during the evening, we used to drag the raft out, prepare some, you know, simple meal, and just collapse onto the sand. Wonderful. Except it, it all sounds quite romantic, but we didn't realize that there are sand ticks in Sri Lanka which make <laughs> <laughs> torment right. you because next day you're scratching all over. So how long and did you actually travel? We Three. traveled about 10 days on the water. Oh, gosh, yes. And bought your food if necessary. Yeah, but the, no, no, we couldn't buy our food. There's, because we all, everyone was 15 feet above the water because right. the water had eroded the banks right. and the tobacco oh. cultivators were up there. and 
the raft wouldn't allow you to even talk to them. You could say hello and hi right. and wave them and you drift. So we were dependent on this huge amounts of paripu and rice which we had to dry out right. because it got wet and it soaked and tends to get so spoiled. So that was all, you had it on the raft and cooked every night? Yeah, 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 that's it. And uh, it took about eight days, I think, eight to ten days. And, but we came across this marvelous sculpture all in the round of an elephant in the water. And it is the most magnificent thing I've ever seen, you know. And uh, looking very much like an elephant actually having a bath. And in the water itself? In the water itself. Did you ever see it again from the land? or? No, no. We, we drifted by it. We slowed down the raft. We clambered near the elephant, looked at it, but couldn't get a photograph because it was, the raft was drifting too fast and it was too quite dangerous because the, it was in a sort of eddy hmm. in the side. And um, you always felt nervous of getting into those eddies because they were deep pools and there was always crocodiles on the banks of the, this thing, you know. So they used to dive into the water and you didn't want to get, right. you know, s slashed by crocodiles. So you, you just get clear of the, you know, midstream. Is not this elephant? Yeah. Has it been recorded by anyone else? Have you seen it since? Uh, uh, what happened was soon after my uh, trip, yeah. when we came back, I acquired a small man, uh, really a diary of a man called Brooke, Richard Brooke, who had done this trip upstream mm -hmm. under the orders of the governor and the survey general. When was that? In, in 1836. But he comes to this area, but the village, uh, but doesn't mention that he has seen this thing, you know, it's very strange. Really? Right. Yeah, because he, he goes across from the river to Garner's coin, describes the archaeology mm. and comes back. But somehow uh, he doesn't mention this. And uh, Philip Crow's team with uh, Dr. Austin and that uh, and Gunaratna, you know, she was in the U.S. Uh, hey, Margaret Gunaratna, yeah, yes. Uh, her husband, he went yeah. on the trip. They had seen it and they, talk, they, they, do they record it. it yeah. right. But H.C.P. Bell was told by a forest department official mm. and he went to see it. And there's a very charming picture. He's taken a photograph of a Moorish boy seated on top of the elephant, right. you know, enjoying the seat. Right. The, exactly. And the, you can see the the uh, you know the in size and scale and of the contour the, right. it looks a real life elephant you know and um, Harry Story who followed afterwards with a man called Cameron they had seen it but few and far I don't think any of the living archaeologists according to Roland has, has anyone has seen actually it, been actually yeah. been there because the only way you can access it is downstream by the by river the marble itself. Yeah. One final question is, just talking about elephants, you yeah. know, you and Ina after 50 years yeah. still have a very close relationship. Yeah. And you go and see her a lot, yeah. I know, but you also go to the jungles with her. Yeah. And I would have thought that the lifestyle yeah. is actually something that is rapidly passing. Yeah. You know, Ina de Silva in the jungles, yeah. as Lucky has described it. Yeah. I think her interest from the time she was a young girl in uh, Ladies College, I think she had an intuitive and rather intense interest in botany. Mm. And so she always, she had an interest in other parts of wildlife as well as birds and so on. But whenever we used to go, she used to carry all these botanical books. I used to bring all the books that I had. And it used to be a huge library of books, you know, lumbering along. But we used to stop and to the annoyance of a lot of the people in the you know, the van or the jeep and the tracker, you know, huge arguments about which tree, when does it flower, has it got the wrong name, has, do, do the trackers know, driving up to right. it to get a thing of the bark and so on. I think, I think I found that was a link which, I had a special link with Ina, it was about that and I have given her a whole host of, uh, you know, books and articles on trees especially trees, you know, and books from Burma, books from Thailand and so on. And I think uh, um, also she, I think she, she liked to stay, with, you know, live and 
work with young people, and you would have realized that he hardly anybody of his oh, own well. age, he, you know, we, we had hardly met them. Right. Must have, you know, kept company, but we hardly ever met them. So this is something that really interested her. The other thing that she, she really was interested in, and which I used to feed her with a lot of information was, I was interested in nat history of natural history. And after that British Council exhibition that we had, hmm. which you were there when at the time, I got a scholarship to go and work at the Victoria Albert Museum, the Kew Gardens, you know. Yes, I think I was yeah, the officer. Yeah, was, yeah and we went, too. I went through the British Museum. I, I must have been to about 15 museums, Army Museum and right. so on. But mainly I went to see the, the documentation by the British that was there and to learn more about how this knowledge permeated and the osmosis of knowledge from 1800 or even before that, even the Dutch times. So I've done a lot of work on that. I go to Singapore, look at all the archival stuff, go to the herbariums there, write about it. And presently I'm just doing a work on a fantastic dynasty of Sinhala artists. Remarkable. Like, but, I mean, thank you very much, Bill. I think what you've exemplified is the need for records, yeah. for remembering. Yeah. Which, of course, is, I hope, what this discussion is also all about. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.